Hey beer geeks, today we're going to be tackling one of the most googled questions in beer and no it's not what is craft. It's what's the difference between a stout and a porter. So Johnny, what is the difference between a pout and a stout and a porter? Because I, I, I get confused. I mean, I mean, this could be an hour long video, but before we get into the history of it, mm -hmm. I think the best thing to do is to taste a stout and a porter and see if we can literally taste the difference. I mean, I'm never gonna argue with that, mate. Let's crack them. Well, let's start with Railway Porter from one of our favorite breweries in London, Five Points. So they make amazing traditional car scale, but also amazing, like really drinkable, strongly bittered, that's kind of their style, like American style beers. Railway Porter was there from the start uh, when Five Points found it. It was something they wanted to do to bring back Porter to East London, which is where London Porter to some extent comes from, but we will get to that. So let's see what we get from a Porter. Ooh, it's very rich, isn't it, Johnny? Milk chocolate. Really chocolatey. Graham cracker. Graham cracker for our American compadres. <laughs> and it's, then red berry? Red berry, yeah, it's got that sort of sweetness. It's, I mean, it smells delightful. It really does, it's, it's really quite, wintry. Very wintry, um, quite sort of desserty in yeah. a way. Yeah, so that I think is something we're gonna have to remember as a key difference is, this smells very sweet, fruity, milk chocolatey. Yeah. There's no real roast here, there's not even no. that kind of coffee it's note. It's not really. super coffee roast, Yeah, no. it would be a very fruity, like, uh, fruity, you know, hipster coffee, basically, essentially, like a black, thick, low acidity, really fruity coffee. Yeah, and that follows through. It feels like maybe you've got some chocolate with a little bit of raspberry or something, just a really nice acidic fruit in there. It's, it's a beautiful beer, and I mean, it's a beautiful style, isn't it, yeah. really? So red fruits, milk chocolate, not super roasty coffee vibes, Tell me about stouts now. So stouts, in theory, are super roasty, a little bit drier. Think Guinness, like we're gonna get some charred notes, we're gonna get some burnt toast, um, but hopefully there's gonna be some complexity underneath that mm. as well. So what we've got here is actually a beer from Cloudwater uh, and a collab with Rock Leopard, which is, I think, the only uh, black-owned brewery in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and it's called Step Up, and they call it an easy drinking stout. Rich and roasty is how they've described their, their stout. Let's give this one a go. So, I mean, it looks visually almost identical. Maybe a tiny bit darker? Could be a little bit darker. Maybe the head's a little bit yeah, darker. Yeah, like through, through the camera lights, like there was a little bit of red with the porter, but yeah, that's pretty dark. none here. Super brown. It's, it's much less aromatic. Like we're both like... Yeah, we're, getting, get we're getting in there more, aren't we? Because it's not as obviously like woomph. Yeah. But it's, I think it's dry, there's no sweetness at all. It's all, you know, brown bread, burnt toast, and pretty heavily roasted coffee, like Italian coffee. Yes. It's all about that coffee, really, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's way drier. The bitterness is coming in. A the lot bitterness more. is there as well, yeah. yeah. Which comes partly from the hops, but also partly from the, the more roasted malts, the heavier roasted malts, mm. the darker malts that they've used. So a porter would typically use more of that speciality range going from like light pale and through to dark. Whereas here, you'll see a lot more on that dark end, both to get that color and that bitterness. I saw this described, I think it was the Guinness website, described their stout as crisp. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense to me, but crisp. actually crisp kind of does work for a stout and it doesn't for a porter. I guess maybe, yeah, it is in a way it's crisper and it kind of finishes a bit sooner. Yeah, maybe. absolutely, yeah. Much yeah. cleaner finish from that bitterness that you have. And it's kind of like leaving my mouth a little bit powdery and dry, yeah. a little bit like a, 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 a really thick coffee would. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, crisp. I guess in, in a way it's also like moorish in the way it's leaving your mouth mm. like that. So you just want to take another swig. Take another swig. Whereas you can sort of luxuriate a bit more mm. in, in the porter. So that, that, that's what modern stouts and porters are. But if we go back in time, Bidoo. So Porter has a huge long history in traditional British brewing and we're going to go right from the 1700s all the way up to now. So if we go back to the 1700s, we don't so much have styles, that wasn't really a thing. You had regional variations in beer yeah. and all of them were served in the pub almost exclusively under two names, which is mild and stale. Mild was young beer that was still sweet 
um, and full-bodied, and it was cheap. Got you. Right, so that's what most people drank, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes. Even the kids. So it must have been fun in the 1700s. That's a bit mild. 30 years of fun, and then, and then death. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then you had stale beer, which was aged beer. It was a bit more expensive, and it fermented further out, because back then, we just had wild yeast fermenting this stuff, yeah. right? So as the beer got older, it would slowly ferment as Britannomyces and all these different bacteria took hold. Funky. So in the pub, you'd order either a mild or a stale, or you could blend the two. And all of this resulted in brewers actually losing a little bit of the sales that they were having. You had people like the distributors were buying mild ale from brewers, and instead of uh, selling it straight on, they were sitting on that beer and aging it themselves, ah, and then selling it on as stale, clever. which took the profit away. And so a couple of brewers decided to make a new style, one that would claw back some of the profits they were losing from the distros, one that would attract people who had started enjoying hoppier styles, or had started enjoying darker styles, or whatever it was. So they brewed a brand new style, and it was called Porter. Huh. So Porter was a long-aged beer, right. usually with better ingredients, and it was a little bit better hopped. Got you. And they started yeah. calling this the Porter. And the reason it's called the Porter is because that is mostly what was drunk in London by the street and the river porters. So the people who okay. were ferrying stuff around London. So did they, did they have a bit of more money? It would have been because that's what was being produced in the areas in which they were working. Right, right, right. So London Porter, which is almost seen as a style now, um, that's called London Porter because that's where it was made. So that's what they'd have had most, um, most access to. So shall we try some Porter based on a recipe from the 1800s? Yeah, that sounds amazing. Okay, so this is... This brewery is one of my favourite discoveries that I've made since the since COVID hit. Yeah. Uh, and this is the Cheshire Brew House. Oh, great stuff. Makes amazing modern beer and loves to dive into beer history and dig out recipes. So this is called Gibraltar Porter. It's a recipe from 1889. Great name. That he's brewed all over again. Um, let's see what details he gives. Here we go. Heritage Porter, originally brewed in 1889 by MCW Langton Brewing Co. on the Isle of Wight. Wow. First brewed by us is in a collaboration with Rising Tide. Here we brew it with Heritage Chevalier Barley Malt, Brown Malt, we're gonna to get to that, Black Malt, Demerara Sugar, and the finest English Goldings. It sounds poetic and beautiful. Um, I don't know why it's called Gibraltar. Porter. Yeah, I should have Googled that before we <laughs> wore our shades. It's, if it's based on something from the Isle of Wight, that's no in it. Whoa, whoa, There you go, glass ahead there for you, oh, buddy. Great stuff. So it's lively. Give, give me a bit of a uh, milk pour there. Don't worry, I'm doing the same to me. <laughs> so it's lively. So we fast forwarded quite a long way to the yeah. point where stout has become a thing. So stout was seen as just a strong beer. Got so again, just like mild could be any colour, any style from anywhere. Same with stout. You could have a stout pale ale in theory. It just meant it was a stronger version. So crazy. I know. So that's where the difference was back then. You'd have a stout porter. It was a stronger porter. And sometimes there seems to be some evidence that a stout would also have used better ingredients, hmm. which kind of makes sense back then because you wouldn't have so much control over the fermentation. So you'd use better ingredients and get more alcohol out of it. That's kind of how that worked. Right. So the stout was just a stout porter. At this point, they're the same beer, just different ABVs. Now things start to get interesting because basically back then in the 1800s, you couldn't put anything in your beer that wasn't taxed. Right, okay. The bloody British government were trying to get their Trying their to get penny, their money on. The king's sovereign or whatever. Exactly, so all the malts were taxed. But people were using different, wanted to use different stuff. They wanted to put sugar in it, but the sugar wasn't taxed at the time. Okay. They wanted to influence the colour, but they couldn't do that with anything other than malt, which was taxed. Got you. So all porter was made with brown malt, which right. is a malt that just isn't really used anymore. Okay. For one really good reason. It's not got a lot of fermentable sugar in it. Ah. Okay? Okay. So the, the roasting process meant that there wasn't a lot of sugar left. So it wasn't a very efficient thing to brew with. No, you're not going to get a very high alcohol beer. Exactly that. Got you. Right. Exactly. So, what then happened is when pale malt started getting more and more popular, people were like, can't we use a bit more pale malt in our porters? Yes. Because then it's more efficient, we'll make more money. Yes. But doing that would mean that it wasn't dark, and people wanted their porter dark. Right. Okay? Yes. So then, in 1819, I want to say, maybe okay. 1817. Sounds like a good year, yeah. Uh, a guy, Mr. Wheeler, invents... Patent malt, otherwise known as black malt. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So black malt 
was a way of basically cooking this malt to the point where it's black and charcoaly. And by using that with pale malt, yeah. you can make a porter that was black but was mostly pale malt. Ooh. So it's that little addition of something that's incredibly charred that gives the colour, yep. gives that a smoky sort of roasty aroma. Exactly that. So suddenly you can make a much more efficient but still dark and still tasty porter. Essentially, brown malt became redundant. So, like, why are we... This is less efficient. Why are we using it? Well, so this is the interesting thing, okay? Right. So, in the UK, out of tradition, out of knowing that brown malt added certain flavours, the British brewers kept a little bit of brown malt in their recipes, hmm. or m mostly. Hmm. So, they left a bit of brown, put lots more pale in, and added a bit of black, and they still got the same colour, right? Got you. In Ireland... They were like, we don't need brown malt anymore. Why would you use brown malt? We'll just uh, put a bit more black in and the rest will be pale. Right? Okay. And that, that led to the Irish dry stout. That's, that's pretty interesting. I like that the Irish uh, evolved it and took it on and went, why are we, why are we spending more money to do this? So screw, just, screw tradition. <laughs> get rid of that. Just have a little bit of that, a lot of that, and you get the same thing. So then Irish dry, Irish dark beers started getting drier and blacker and roastier right, and right. English ones retained a little bit more fruitiness that you'd have got from that brown malt. Okay. Then in 1880, oh, the laws more. changed, oh, right? And okay. you can start adding different stuff to your beer. Right. So that's how we end up with Dem Dem Demerara sugar. Nice. And stuff like that. And that would have been beer. used historically, Demerara sugar? Yeah. 100% wow. that would have been imported and used in beer to get a higher gravity. So this beer, I'm about to blow your socks off, Brad, is 8.1%. God damn, I haven't tried it yet, yeah, but... Let's give it a go. Yeah, it's almost like a Christmassy spicy kind of... Definitely Christmas spice. Almost kind of Brett hints. Yeah, there's a, there's a funk, there's Which a might sour... Explain why it poured like it did. A sort of acidity to it. Interesting. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, wow. Oh, it's still going. It's still going. It's such a phenomenal beer. <laughs> you get that kind of real funky breathiness. It works so well with the roast. Mm. I'm salivating because it's just... It's just like that red berry thing. Slightly puckering, sweet, yeah. sour, red berry note. Along with the funk, with the roast. With the big roast as well. It's really... It's amazing. It's absolutely stunning. Mm. Um, and a really light body as well which would have been more representative of the time. If you were drinking a stale, so an older beer, or a porter, which would have been a well-aged beer, it would have been dry. You'd have had that mixed fermentation happening, all that Britannomyces and the different Saccharomyces um, would have come in and eaten almost all the sugar. So all of these beers, if they were aged, would have been really dry. And, you know, this is, you know, we've got modern techniques for making these malts that he's used. He's used modern hops, of course, but... This is as close as we'll ever really get to tasting a beer from that period and what a porter would have been like back then. I want to go back in time, Johnny. So in summary, Bradley. Yeah, mate. Modern stouts, roast, coffee, burnt toast. Modern porters. Milk, chocolate, red fruits. Absolutely. And not a lot of roast. Not a lot of roast. Porters back in the 1800s. Bing, bang, bong. <laughs> sensational. <laughs> sort of juice, crazy... Yeah. Roast, sour, all of it combined. Yeah. And you know what? Back then, this probably would have been described as a stout porter. Just to make it even more confusing. Just to make it even more confusing, because it, it was a really strong porter. Blimey. Right? And that was the difference back then. Stout just meant strong. And that started to blur as a result of the Irish uh, taking brown malt out of the recipe. Mm. So originally, the Guinness stout would have yes. been a porter. It was Got a porter. You. And they started associating stout with being high quality. So I think that's where that marketing shift happened. Got you. And Guinness are responsible for that confusion happening. Well, I mean, they, they've absolutely smashed it, really, haven't they, in terms of world dominance. Uh, they, did, they did okay with that marketing switch, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> they were like, we don't need the brand. We know, we know what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to blow your mind one more time before the end of this video. Everybody talks about IPA, India Pale Ale, being the beer that was shipped over to India and to other parts of the colonies uh, back in the 17 and 1800s. And it's kind of taken over that narrative, right? Yeah. If we were like, what beer was shipped to India during, during the empire? Oh, IPA. People that don't even know about beer, IPA. Yeah. Well, let me tell you that 
the IPA was a tiny, tiny fraction of what was sent over. No. Most of what was sent over was porter. What? You would not want to drink this in a hot climate, <laughs> unless you live in Florida. But that's the interesting thing. You see so much Guinness in hot climates. Like you it's do. super African looked, Guinness, exactly, and in the Caribbean kinds. as well. Yeah, yeah, they, do. yeah. There's all sorts. And I think it's because it's crisp. It does have it's that crispness crisp. to it. I, I kind of don't want to admit it, but it is crisp. Yeah. In a way, is it like drinking a uh, uh, hot tea on a hot day, sort of thing? Like it could be. Know, is or, it that kind of effect? It could be. I never understood that. We, we need again. to go and understand this. We, we need to understand this. But anyway, that's why we've had this elephant in the room, the Colonel Export India Porter, because that is inspired by what would have been going out there, except this has Citra and Enigma in it. <laughs> so a very different beer now. So there you go. I hope that little bit of beer history was enjoyable, not just a mess of, of me regurgitating in the file. I'll put some links below if you did get confused, as well as said that article about Michael Jackson. Um, yeah, I guess we'll just sit back and enjoy a little blast from the far distant past.